everybody and welcome back to the Irish Influence. Um, I see numbers coming up here, so people are actually in the building. I can't see you, but you can see me, and I think you can also see Mike Cronin, my co-host here, and uh, alongside him you'll see our guest tonight, Donald Ryan. I'm going to introduce Donald himself in a few moments, but first of all, just to um, thank you all for attending uh, last semester and to tell you that we've got at least as exciting a lineup this coming semester. I'm not going to go into details about it. Maybe we'll give you a few names uh, at the end uh, this evening when we're, when we're finished. But even again, before we continue, what I'd really like to do is to thank once more um, the people from the Consulate General. And I mean, of course, the wonderful Leisha Moore, Shane Caffrey, who are uh, so generously uh, sponsored Irish influence here last semester, and again, coming in into this, this coming year. So maybe we'll uh, go ahead with the introductions and Donald Ryan, some of you will already know, Donald of course is one of the brilliant new wave of Irish writers that we've seen appear over the last couple of decades. And I'm especially happy that Donald has already got a long association with Boston College and particularly with the uh, Burns Library Special Collection here. Don was born outside Nina in County Tipperary in 1976. He's married with two children and he lives just across the border there in County Limerick in a small village called, I think, Castlereagh. Um, after his local schooling in Tipperary, uh, Donald went on to take a degree in law from the University of Limerick. And that's the place where he now lectures, but not in law, but of course, much more excitingly, in creative writing. Donald's first two novels, The Spinning Heart and The Thing About December, were between them rejected 47 times before being accepted for publication. But that was, of course, followed by resounding success. Donald has won so many awards for his fiction, among them the European Union Prize for Literature, the Guardian First Book Award, and four Irish Book Awards. He's been shortlisted for several more, including the Costa Book Award, the Impact Award, and the Prix Jean Monnet. I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce that more accurately as it continues. Your books, Donald, have been translated into over 20 languages and your most recent novel, Strange Flowers, which I've just reread and enjoyed every bit as much as everybody else did, has won the novel of the year in the Unpost Irish Book Awards. And that's not entirely true, not one, but was voted actually. So, I mean, it's by popular acclaim that you're here and people are calling for you. Thanks very much. You're very welcome to be here, Don. Thank you. Nice to Thanks see so you. Thanks so much, Joe. My pleasure. It's great to be here. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, it was a little later in your life, Don, as we heard there, actually, uh, that you came to attention of people as a writer. Can you tell me, maybe, um, did you always, were you always a storyteller, would you say, with that? Well, I was a pretty shy child, actually, um, Joe. Um, and so I wasn't, you know, I wasn't um, really given to um, making a show of myself. It's you know? <laughs> the cardinal sin in Ireland, you know, to make a show of yourself. Um, and, you know, and I was almost very shy about the idea of being a writer and the idea of, you know, proclaiming myself to be a writer or an artist because there was a slight embarrassment attached to it, um, a slight shame attached to it. Um, you know, I really, my, my, my overriding ambition in life was to kind of um, have a kind of, it sounds terrible, but a manly existence, you know, to be a sportsman and a builder and engineer. And, you know, <laughs> so I tried, I tried to kind of push away my artistic impulses as much as possible. It was ridiculous, really. I mean, it's just, it was a silly way of thinking. But still, it always came, came out. Um, and, you know, I, there were moments in my teenage years when I kind of um, outed myself as an artist. And, all of us, and, and it was always received, you know, with warmth and, and encouragement, you know, by my friends and family. So I don't, I don't really know why I subverted it so much for so long. But I did always try. Um, and I think really one of the main reasons was because I just felt I was so bad at it, you know. And this, this, this thing that was in the back of my mind always, and this thing that I, you know, secretly identified as um, a writer was something that I believed myself to be really bad at. Um, but still, you know, I, I lived, I think I, I might have um, told this, this crazy sounding story to Jim's class about living in a, a haunted apartment for almost a decade, um, <laughs> having this really isolated existence um, and being a real cliche. You know, I was a stereotyped, frustrated artist. I, I had a, a low level, um, clerical job that I loved actually, you know, I really loved my job and my, my colleagues, but it was, you know, it wasn't something that 
took up much headspace outside of work. I could clock out and leave and not think about it very much. And so I had loads of time and space to be a writer and I tried and tried um, and, and always felt deeply ashamed of what I produced. And so I burnt, I mean, I burnt reams of paper over the sink so I could flush it away with the tap so it would not be extant any longer. There would be no trace of this idiocy in, in the universe. <laughs> Awful way of thinking, you know, but I mean, I wouldn't say I'm alone in that at all, really. I think there, there are probably loads of guys from the, the same kind of background as I'm from who would have thought the same way, would have been a little bit um, mortified about the whole idea of, mm -hmm. of you know, the character of a writer. One thing, Donald, I mean, I, I kind of read an interview with you where you talked about kind of growing up in a house full of books where your kind of parents seem to buy them in job lots. I mean, again, for the kind of developing or the frustrated writer, the emerging writer, what kind of things were you reading when you were a teenager living down absolutely there was actually there was one, one banned book in our house and that was i claudius by robert graves um because my mom and dad had seen the, B the bbc adaptation which was apparently yeah <laughs> semi-pornographic <I remember. laughs> and so we had a copy of that it was off limits there were naked people that's the point and you know it really actually it, that, that lingered for years I, I didn't get around to reading claudius until about four years ago and i absolutely loved it and claudius the god follow-up was equally brilliant um you know it just didn't see my head off i said well oh, i better not read i'm not allowed to read that you know mama go mad <laughs> but yeah my parents did t seem to buy um books and job lots from auctions at you know semi stately homes and jumble sales and you know they, they just bring boxes of books into the house and actually when we eventually got a bigger house. Um, years later, my parents built a small library and um, they appended a small library to the back of the house. And it was just, it was a, a moment of huge pride for my family to have an actual library in the house, Absolutely. you know, a room dedicated to books. It was just such a beautiful thing. Um, and it's still there actually, but it's more of a TV room now, but it's still, it's, it's still part of the library. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I mean, there was never any shortage of encouragement. I mean, no one would have, no one would have given out to me or, or, or told me not to, not to be silly about being a writer. Um, I remember once I, I got halfway through a novel um, and it got out, it was leaked home. I think a friend might have said to my mum, oh, you know, Donald's writing a book. And she was just so happy because I know she, she knew that this thing was in my heart, you know, and she, she wanted me to do it. And she remember her being so disappointed when I, when I, I didn't finish the book. And it actually, the, the, that half novel turned up years later on a hard drive um, in my mother-in-law's house. <laughs> a hard drive of a PC I'd given her. I, I, I thought I'd, I'd destroyed every copy of it. <laughs> and Betty rang me and started to read, she started to read his novel on the phone to me. She goes, I found this very strange thing in that hard drive. <laughs> oh, it was embarrassing. But still, you know, it's, I'm glad actually that it survived. That's very, very lovely. Um, and so you worked in, in the civil service, is that right? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and it was possible to work in the civil service and to write at the same time. Was there, was there any conflict involved there? Was that well, not, not initially, no, actually. And I, I had such great friends in the civil service. And one friend in particular, um, Frances Kelly, um, Nee McNamara, she was, God, she was a great friend. And I remember her always saying to me, because I used to write these small articles for the, uh, the Union magazine. Um, and, you know, and I always try to make them funny and interesting. Um, and she was always saying to me, oh, you really should write a book. You should really write a book. And she, she said it almost every day to me. You know, I remember Francis was so proud when eventually I did write a book and got a deal. And, you know, and she actually was one of the first people to read my very first Finnish novel. So it was great. But um, it was fine. When I was a clerical officer, you know, when I was at, in an entry grade, it was fine. But um, later on, when I got my first publishing deal, I was a labor inspector. So I worked for the National Employment Rights Authority. Um, and so I was actually, and, and I wrote Spinning Hearts. And... At the centre of the spinning heart is um, an employer who has defrauded his employees and left the country. <laughs> and I mean, I was, I, I had a job at the time where I was investigating people just like that. You know, I was, so there definitely was something there in my contract, you know, forbidding <laughs> this book being published. And my poor boss, Danny Losty, oh, he's such a nice guy. I remember him reading the book on, oh, Donny, please tell me now, tell me now that you didn't write this book about somebody, you know, one of your real cases. He said, well, you know, it's, it's kind of a composite of all my cases, really. He said, ah, yeah, it's fine. Don't worry, don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> but luckily, you know, I, I, was, I resigned shortly afterwards, regretfully, because, you know, I, I love that job so much. But it started to be impossible, really, you know, to, to do two things. Because that was a very involved job. That was the kind of job that could take over your life. Drawing then on characters around you, whether you should or you shouldn't, yeah. is, is a given. A drawing on your own childhood then. I wonder, I mean, if this, uh, this kind of question about that always arises for, for, for writers there. The characters who you write about. And in The Spinning Heart, of course, that poly, 
symphonic um, novel there with so many different voices. Um, how much of yourself, how much of your own childhood can I dare to ask is there within that? Or is that an easy question to ask? Well, like some of my colleagues, like Colin McCann and, and Enright, I have been hobbled by having had a very happy childhood and having been very um, protected and absolutely cosseted as a child and spoilt. And, you know, I was, the, the evil that was lurking in the world was completely hidden from me. Um, and so, I, that actually, I think that that in a way helped my development as a writer because I, I was shocked into the awareness of so many things in my teenage years and my early 20s and still to this day I'm shocked into awareness all the time and I think you know I I, I, I you know I, I go into the world in a state of almost perpetual idiocy and I think that's a good way for a writer to be because you're you're almost almost then in a state of precipitous wonder you're always on the brink of, of wondering about something about being shocked into an awareness of something some element of of this human existence and it helps but um i think strange flowers is definitely my most autobiographical book um paddy and kit ladney are based on my grandparents um the location of the village they live in is the where my grandparents cottage was and, the, and they were um caretaker farmers you know they they, they they farmed a farm for another family who were nothing like the uh, the fam the jackmans in the book actually they were beautiful people um, but you know, it's so I, I drew on my childhood and, and drew my on my parents' childhoods um, on the place I'm from, place I love dearly. And, you know, and it's amazing. You know, I remember hearing um, a few weeks after the book came out, it was reviewed on Irish radio, and the reviewer, she kind of said, like, there's no way this could have, could have happened. You know, a, a person like Alexander Elmwood, a black man from London, arriving in this Irish village in the 70s, she was kind of saying he nearly would have been killed. And I was, I really think that I was just felt it was just such an unfair thing to say about this place I'm from, where the people, and maybe I'm just very lucky in this, but the people are so kind and gentle. Um, and, and the situation itself was not far from the truth of situations like that in that place at all. You know, I mean, this, you know, it, it's amazing the, the, the presumptions people make about who you are as a person when you write a book um, and, and, you know, and what rights you have to tell certain stories and the things people you know believe with no evidence about the composition of your family about the history of your of your of your native place um but you know i suppose that's kind of beside the point really that ireland of the 70s out of which um yeah. you came and that you described so so beautifully in that novel indeed and maybe we'll come back to speak about that in a little while because i'd like to hear how you feel about that Ireland that has passed and, and what we may have lost and, and what we may have gained along that way. But just think for a moment actually with, with, with the characters. So we're talking about your ability to, to take on uh, the voices of, of, of people whom you've perhaps met and knew in your time. But then again, you take on some very, very peculiar voices. Uh, you take the, on the voices of travelers, you've talked about Syrian refugees and that. And what's that process for, I wonder? That's, that's demand. Yeah. Well, none of these, th these things required a huge stretch for me because I was involved professionally for years, for maybe seven years with people from Syria and um, Iraq and Iran and countries that were, you know, at the time war torn and, you know, from where people had come to seek refuge in Ireland. Yeah. And so on an almost daily basis, I, I spoke to people in that kind of situation, in the situation that Farouk is in, in, in my book from Low and Quiet Sea. Um, and, you know, when it comes to, Travellers. I mean, travellers are Irish people. Um, travellers are, a, you know, a particular group. They're a particular community in Ireland. Um, but, you know, are not strangers to me in any way at all. You know, but, but still there are elements of the, the traveller community that are, I suppose, largely occluded from, from, from our eyes. You know, there, there are things that, that we're not privy to. Um, and there are things about the way that some travellers live that seem shocking to us, that aren't shocking to travellers, you know. And... I mean, I grew up in a town where travellers lived in the houses near my house and people from the traveling community were in my class in school. Um, and I worked in a job for, for years where I had constant contact with, with travellers. Um, and I, I knew them, I knew their voice. Um, and of course, you can't say that either. You know, I mean, you can't homogenize ever. Um, it, it, and, and you can't say I know a certain type of person. Um, I, I, know, I know these people because we're all so different and we all have our own individual discrete universe that we, that we occupy. Um, and, but, but still, you know, I, I, I wasn't coming at the, uh, the area of, of, the, of, of traveller culture or traveller lifestyles completely blind. 
So, so again, I'm hearing you actually speaking out of your own experience in that. And before we go any further, I'd just like to remind people indeed that, that you're very, very welcome to ask any questions that you want to join in the conversation there. As you see, if you look down below, you've got a question and answer little button um, down at the bottom of your screen. And you've also got one that's called chat. So either of those will actually do with any questions that you'd like to, to put to me, not put to me at all, but of course, um, to put to Tony Ryan here in front of us. I will look uh, at both of them. Please. Sorry, sorry, Mike. I was just going to say, I'll, I'll check both the Q&A and the chat box. If people want to start talking, we can funnel that down. Thanks very much, Mike. Thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit more just about, about your writing, Donald, and about the way you write. Um, I, I'm always struck, and I think many people are struck, by the often lyrical, the almost musical quality of your, of your sentences, the, the way that they meander very, very beautifully from place to place. And I wonder how much of that is owed, would you say, to to the language of the people that you grew up in. I, do, do people speak Hiberno-English rather differently down in Tipperary? Is, and obviously you work upon this, but is there something that you're drawing on there that's about rural Ireland, perhaps? Absolutely. Um, you know, there's a, I, I love the way that we deconstructed the English language for ourselves in Ireland, and we reconstructed it along the uh, Gaelic template and so we we inverted syntax and you know and we we kept the we kept the, the cadence and the structure of of Irish sentences and overlaid English on it and this and this developed um and I love the the multiplicity of voices you can hear on any in, in any given moment in any Irish place whether you're in Dublin city or you know a small village in, in Clare Tipperary um you know because you know, idiomatic phrases change from from townland to townland from road to road in rural Ireland it's amazing um and there's just something so beautiful about the cadence and rhythm of of Irish rural speech it's just I, I love it I could listen to it all day and it doesn't matter whether, whether it's you know County Kevin or, or South Kerry it's just there's something beautiful about it um and this is true this is true of anywhere English is spoken I mean you know it's true of language in general it's true of, of all human voices you know I mean the way we use language we use words um can be so beautiful and you know i'm always struck by the the potential and the the the, the massive power of language and also by the, the limits of language you know the things we can't do with language um and that's i think it's a writer's job just to push language as far as we can to stretch it um and, and to do as much as is humanly possible with words um but at the end of the day it is it is it is limited um but you know i mean the the, the so-called um demotic voices of my characters yeah. It's what allowed me to be a writer. It's what allowed me to, to divest myself of the shame and embarrassment of this this idea of being a writer because I was I was on this I, I had this this lunatic project I worked on for years where I I, I sat I would sit down to write sporadically um, in my haunted apartment <laughs> and the ghost was encouraging me. She was whispering in my ear, going, "Yeah, you should do it. Be a writer." And I would sit down to write, and I would always sit down to write in a kind of a slightly heightened middle-class English voice. <laughs> it, it, it didn't make any sense. You know? I mean, I'm, a, I'm an Irish Catholic. I'm a Republican. I'm from a small Irish market town. I was originally from a small village near that market town. You know, um, the, the English middle class has got nothing to do with me. <laughs> but for some reason, I thought this was how a writer wrote. You know, this is the kind of voice a writer should use. I don't know why. I mean, and I was very well read and educated. You know, there was no reason for this stupidity, but it just, it was something I didn't even think about. And so that's the way I always wrote. That, that's the voice I always wrote in. I, I think maybe I was thinking in my head, this is the kind of voice that an editor in a publishing house would have. So, yes. so that's the kind of person I want to speak to because, you know, I just, I had a secret ambition of being a published writer. It took me years to realize, you know, the, the simple expedient of writing in my own voice, in my own so-called demotic, my own people's voice um, was what would allow me to write a story that, that felt like it flowed, that didn't fill me with shame and burning desire just to rip it up or burn it. Yeah, and you know, I was almost going to ask uh, who were the writers from that library behind, from the books that your parents were, were bringing into the house, who of those writers were the ones who influenced you, but it almost sounds as if actually I should be asking which of those writers had you to reject in order to discover the voice. Yeah, exactly. You know, I was very, I remember being very young actually and, and reading um, Norman Mailer's book, um, The Executioner's Song. And I didn't, I didn't know much about the book. I started to read it and it was probably a few years ahead of my reading level, you know, um, but I remember just thinking, 
this thing happened in America. And I knew it was based, just I, I, I kind of vaguely knew because my cousin Tony Sheary told me um, it was based on the first execution to take place after a moratorium by the Supreme Court of, I think, 14 years. And Gary Gilmore was executed in Utah, I think, in 1974 or 75. And there was a passage in that book where um, Mailer describes Gary Gilmore being shot because he elected, apparently, to be shot. You know, he was allowed to elect his method of execution. Um, and Mailer described blood from his wounds dripping onto his prison issue trainers, his, and, onto the lace of his white trainers. And the image of that drop of red blood on Gary Gilmore's prison issue trainer just seared an indelible mark in my consciousness. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, this guy in America, Norman Miller, um, wrote these words, and now those words have formed a picture in my mind, and I, and I cannot get that picture out of my head. You know, and for one thing, it made me a lifetime, lifelong opponent of capital punishment. Um, I would have been anyway, I think, but that's, that's where it started. But also, it just impressed on me the absolute power of storytelling, of narrative, of language. You know, that that thing was now in my head, that came out of a man's head because he saw it in America and he wrote these words, and they had formed a picture in my head. Um, yeah. And also, you know, and my parents, they did have a lot of mid-century Americans in the house. Um, we had a lot of Victorian novelists in the house. Um, I, I read lots of Dickens as a child and absolutely loved it. Um, I think, and I don't think any writer can read Dickens and not be influenced by Dickens. Yeah. And the way, you know, that, the way a story accretes around a character in, in Dickens' books, you know, and this thing just wells up and you absolutely cannot put it down. Even the longest of his books, it's, it's never hard work reading Dickens. You know, even when it's dense and the, the language can seem a little bit abstruse. It's yeah. just there's something about it. It's just pure magic. Right. right. Okay. Can I ask a question in my middle class English voice? Um, <laughs> <laughs> You'll get over it, Mike. Don't worry, actually. <laughs> I've, I've realised I've missed my calling as a novelist, does he? Um, a couple of people have asked a question about whether, uh, Donald, your training for your law degree influenced you as a writer in any way. Oh, I, I think so. I really think so. Um, I, I, I remember my very first law lecture, um, it was Professor Paul McCutcheon, and he was teaching us criminal law. And every single thing he told us was in the form of a story. He would tell us a story of a case, you know, like R versus R and Crown versus Parks. He told us the story of a man who who woke up one night, didn't he didn't wake up, he got out of bed one night and drove 20 miles across Toronto and took a shotgun and killed his parents-in-law, got back in his car and drove home, went back to bed and was acquitted because he was asleep for the whole for the whole act um but i remember paul telling the story i mean just it was just i was literally we were, we were on the edges of our seats you know because i mean all every single court case every single legal concept is a for, is a narrative and i mean you know there's such it's, it's such a, a fertile place um actually i remember being asked by daniel mclaughlin who's a fantastic writer a few years ago she was writing um she was editing an anthology based on um the court reports and i said and she wanted people who were writers and lawyers to be involved and I said no because I said no, Daniel. You know, I'm not a lawyer. I did my law degree. I never practiced law, and I just, I again, you know, that shame just started to develop me again. But I'm a fraud. I'm a fraud. I couldn't do it. I would have felt fraudulent about doing it. But there's such material there. I mean, even attending court as a labour inspector. I mean, my cases were always last on the ticket for some reason. So you had to be there all day long to hear what was going on. Um, but it was just, I, I was so entertained for the whole four years of my, my law degree in UL. And Raymond Freel actually was our contract, um, our contract law lecturer. I think he's head of the school now, Ray Freel. He's, he was a, I think he's either American or Canadian. He was fantastic. He was so good. I mean, we used to clap, we used to applaud every lecture. You know, I mean, he <laughs> did almost a standing ovation as he was leaving. It was like 10 o'clock at night because I did my, my debut by night, you know, after, after work. And we're all tired, but it was just, it was just so good. I mean, he made contract law come to life. You know, <laughs> that takes some doing. <laughs> Definitely, absolutely. I mean, and the, the the whole discipline involved in studying law and sitting down and writing, you know, legal essays and trying to make them live somehow and make them, you know, and, and get them up into the high grades, you know, you had to do something kind of small but special somehow. It was really, it was a great training for, for because, I, you know, I, I wrote my first full novel after doing my law degree. Um, it was just such great training, absolutely. The discipline of writing and the discipline of thought, really. The interesting thing that Donald, I mean, obviously, I mean, law law is not an easy degree. I mean, there's, there's work in there, no matter how good the storytelling. Mm. Again, I mean, something I was reading, you'd, you'd made the comment when you worked on the sort of character of Farouk and the whole um, Syrian issue that you, have at one level, positioned yourself as sort of reading this through the media and the stories you're familiar were with, and then you kind of almost put up a red flag and said, "I don't like to over-research because you lose your own voice." 
And I was just again, about saying that, Mike. I really regret ever saying that in public. Because all right, okay. <laughs> I'm being <laughs> the stick. I'm being beaten with. It's like I handed people his weapon to hit me. And I'm not saying you did it there, but you know, I remember I read a review of Strange Flowers in the Guardian newspaper, and the reviewer said Donald Rhymes is a self-confessed lazy researcher. You know, I, told <laughs> you, I saw I, I, why. I mean, I'm really. She actually was cross with me. She goes, "Why did you call yourself lazy? You know, people will tell you now for the rest of your life that you're lazy. You idiot. You know, and she was so totally right. You know." What I meant was, you know, I, I, I kind of, I, I, I don't like to research too forensically or assiduously any, any given topic because I, I will then assign myself the task of explaining or mansplaining <laughs> that thing to the reader, you know. <laughs> but I'm wondering um, how, it, how it talks back to the law thing, and then you were talking about the capital punishment case. But actually what you've got there is, and what comes through is this deep affinity that isn't about facts and figures and research. It's about exactly, a real exactly. kind of love for embrace of what you're re researching writing about that's it's exactly human. What to be. yeah and i hope it's been recorded i want to actually i'm going to take that parcel it up and use that actually as my explanation <laughs> for why i call myself a lazy researcher yeah. i do think that the that the actual the slog of research can 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 sometimes quench the love you have for the thing you're writing about and the thing you're trying to understand but then it, i know i do absolutely understand how it is necessary you know, but when it comes to very quotidian, you know, um, technical things, I, I do tend to fly by the seat of my pants at times and say to myself, oh, you know, I'll, I'll write this now because it seems right. And I promise myself I will research it properly at the end of this draft. And sometimes I forget. You know, I did it once. Um, I described, I, I, I give words to the controls of the cockpit of a jet for a story called um, From a Starless Night. And I said to myself, okay, I, I'm pretty sure there's a thing called an altimeter in the plane. I put that in. And there's a tiller pedal, I think, you know, but I'm not sure. I'll, I'll Google it later. I'll write the story first. The story's coming. And then I forgot to Google these things. And then the story was published. You know? <laughs> and I was telling the story on, on radio about, about forgetting to Google the controls of a jet or what they were called. Um, and my editor rang me and he goes, I can't believe that he goes, I just presumed, that, you know, they were written there with such authority in the story. I just presumed that you Googled it at least, you know. <laughs> but luckily, you know, they actually weren't correct phrases. There is an altimeter and tiller pedal in the plane, so... But that's, that's kind of what I meant, you know, when, when it comes to the important stuff, when it comes to the way people speak, when it comes to a prevailing belief of a community, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to avoiding cliche and avoiding stereotypes, mm -hmm. you have to be assiduous, you have yeah. to be fair, and you have to, you have to use absolute probity, absolutely. Yeah, yeah so I, I mean, I, like, the lesson for me in that was just don't slag yourself off to interviewers, because it's going to come back to bite you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to just to, to stick with that for a moment, actually, just as you're talking about stereotypes and talking about community. And then going back to, you're talking about Patty, the character mm -hmm. at, at the center, I, perhaps, of Strange Flowers. Now, the story is about Mal. It, it, it begins with this emptiness, this, this, this woman who has disappeared from her ordinary Irish Catholic family and the bewilderment and the puzzlement on the part of the mother and father at this, at this, at this unexplainable loss. But the character who stands out very strongly for me actually is Paddy, the man whom you've just said actually is, is, um, is, is based upon your own grandfather there. And he will be, I suppose we might say stereotypically or even cliched Irish repressed male. And if, and if you don't mind, just tie that in with yourself, just speaking a little while ago, saying that as you grew up, above all else, it was what you, you want to be a writer, you wanted to be a man, and, and there were Irish types of maleness. And stuff. Anything to say about that, and, and, and the pressure, and the power, and that emotional repression about the Irish male? Yeah. When I write um, Irish male characters, I have to absolutely forget about the words stereotype and cliche, because no matter what you do, you are going to be accused of engaging in stereotypes and cliche. And, you know, I mean, something, a thing is a cliche for a reason, because it's true. Um, you know, I mean, there's the cliche, I mean, I remember being told, you know, people being slightly aggressive about it, you know, accused me of, of perpetuating the cliche of the bare knuckle traveler boxer. And, you know, this is, this is a real thing. You know, I, I know bare knuckle boxers who are travelers, you know, there's no point in me denying that this exists, that traveler families sometimes resolve disputes by having a bare knuckle fight. You know, and, there's, and there's, there's often a real savagery in it, but there's a real nobility in it as well. And there's a real belief on the part of the people involved that this is the right thing to do. And it often, of course, goes horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you know, it, on the one hand, you can say, well, that's that's Donald Ryan perpetuating a cliche. And on the other hand, you could say that's Donald Ryan describing something that's true and real that happens every day in this country. Um, and the same with the repressed Irish male. I mean, I was surrounded by them. I am one myself. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 there's no point in me denying that there is a brand of, of oppression, you know, in Irish malehood. Um, it's not just Irish male. You know, I mean, I, I, I set my stories among a certain milieu in a certain place because it's what's familiar to me. And it makes my research easy. It makes the thematic voice easy to engage with because it's my own voice. Um, but I think there's a universality about that. This happens all over the world, in all sorts of places, in all sorts of communities. There is no community of people in any one place in the world where everybody is, you know, um, everybody is completely liberal and everybody is completely free with their emotions and everybody is, everybody is completely who they really are at all times. It doesn't happen anywhere for anybody. Um, you know, that's, that's, if, if you are in that state of being, you're an extremely fortunate person. Yeah. And so I really have to not worry about being accused of engaging in cliche or stereotyping. Um, you know, it's just, it's just, I have to just forget about it. It's, and, I, and I have to accept that it's going to happen, that when the story is published, that, you know, there are people who's going to say, well, that's just a cliche, that's a stereotype. But I think, you know, of course, I mean, if I was going to describe, you know, cliche is when you do it badly, I think. Right. You know, cliche it can be used fairly as a pejorative when you describe when you do when you homogenize and generalize and you know and, and and do it wrong i guess i'm wondering here actually whether when you're doing these things whether you see yourself as explaining or exposing uh these these, these stereotypes and ring them to the people in other words I, I i'm wondering if if this is about if there's a moral purpose behind your writing if you see yourself as out there exploring these issues about Syrian refugees, about travellers, or about Irish males for a good purpose. Do you think that that's within your capability? Do you think that's almost your duty as a writer? I think about this a lot, actually, Joe. Um, and um, I, I often think about um, what should be my motivation as a writer. You know, what should be my motivation, not what is my motivation. My motivation to write is simply that, just to write, because it's, 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 it's always been the thing that I know I am. It's just this, it's been this knowledge, you know, as, as much as I pushed it away and as much as I was secretive about it and ashamed of it, it's this knowledge that I always had inside myself that I am a writer. Um, and I'm not sure to what extent I can moralize, you know, because what, what, what the hell do I know about anything anyway? Um, you know, fiction for me is a series of guesses and there's a spectrum of, of, of informedness that, you, that, you're, that you're operating on at all times. Um, because I don't know, I can never know for sure that I know what it's like to be somebody else. And writing a fictional character is, is yeah. being engaged in the act of trying to feel what it's like to be somebody else. It's, it's you're engaged in an act of almost unnatural empathy. Um, yeah. And so I don't know if I have an obligation to be political or to moralize or to say to people, this is how things should be. Because what the hell do I know? I mean, the only thing I know for an absolute fact is that no human should ever by design hurt another human. And everything else for me is up for grabs. You know, but that's a very fundamental thing. Kindness is fundamental to the Christian upbringing that I, that I was given. Um, and, and that's kind of it. And so, I mean, I'm trying to find a quote here. Um, a quote here from Chekhov when he talked about, you know, the way Tolstoy um, declared that he didn't, that even though he loved Chekhov, that he didn't believe Chekhov to be a good playwright because, because of that very reason, because he just, he was too direct, he was too obvious, he just described life, he didn't, he didn't moralize, he wasn't political. And of course I can't find, um, I can't find the uh, quote, but I'll find it again. But that's what he meant, you know, I really, I, I subscribe to that myself, you know, I think it's my job to try to, to have perspicacity about life um, and to try to, you know, to, 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 to deliver a story that says, crystalline as possible about how humans act and how humans interact, you know, and how and there's and never a danger that that commitment to kindness and that imperative to empathy can, can interfere with your storytelling or is it ever threatened to damage the tale you're telling? Absolutely. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's something that you have to work on. That's, that's why you have to draft and redraft and why you have to try to and you have to try to aim for something approaching a feeling of rightness about a story. I mean, you'll never achieve perfection. It doesn't exist. But I mean, my, my real, my ambition as a writer is to narrow the gap between the reader and the page as much as possible so that it's as easy as possible for a reader to forget the reading, um, to enter that, that 
mythical state, the, fic the fictive dream, you know, where you've decided to accept what you're reading or viewing or watching on stage as reality for that time. Yeah, and I often talk about a production I saw once of Geraldine Aaron's play, A Galway Girl. Um, and and Marie and I went to see it very early on in our relationship. Um, and it was um, an amateur production in the Bell Table Theatre in Limerick. And this guy from, from West Limerick was playing, it's two-hander, A Galway Girl. And it's, it's a play about a marriage. Um, it wasn't a very happy marriage. And this young West Limerick actor was on stage. He's a farmer, apparently, a red-haired guy, and he played the part of the husband. And it was just, what the guy did was incredible. You know, he became an old man throughout the play. Um, and his, 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 the, the actress who played the, his wife was just as good. But something about his performance struck me because he changed, he contorted himself slightly. He changed his aspect slightly. Um, it's a, you know, it's a one-act one play, and so there was no makeup involved, and he became an old man before my eyes. And I completely forgot, I was sitting at the bell table, beside my girlfriend watching a play. I was just so absolutely engrossed and absorbed in this couple's life together. And at the very end, you know, at the very end, when you realize they actually, they were in love all along. He really loved her. He was crazy about her. He just could never say it. You know, he could never, he could never do it. God, my heart broke. And then I was kind of, I was walking from fictive dream and I realized I was there. I was in that place, you know? And I said, I said then, you know, that, that's what I want to do as a writer. That's, that's, that's the state I want to lull readers into as a writer. Gorgeous, a, a, a gorgeous, gorgeous aspiration. And, and speaking only for myself, Don, like I said, that you absolutely succeed hugely. There are lots of questions coming in there. Michael, uh, Mike, would you like to? Yes, uh, so we're on to, from a lone quiet seat. John, I'm going to give you two questions, Donald. John asked you what came to you first, the ending or the stories that led to it? And Caitlin says, Lampy in From a Low and Quiet Sea, could you talk about the development of that character? I particularly love the scene when he's thrown out as a fish and chip shop, a badge of honor <laughs> for any man. <laughs> um, God, you know, two of my most disliked characters, actually, by readers um, are Lampy in From a Low and Quiet Sea and, and Josh in Strange Flowers. <laughs> the, two, the two characters are absolutely me, you know, I didn't just do... There was no stretch at all for Lampy or for Josh. They're both completely drawn from my own life, from my own psyche, from my own soul. I wrote myself onto the page, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I remember being, you know, being young and drunk and stupid and getting upset over stupid things and getting in rows, you know, like, like you do when you're a young man. And, and, you know, luckily getting away with it for the most part. Um, and so, you know, those, those scenes with Lampy and... What he, you know, how he interacts with his grandfather. I mean, you know, I suppose there's a part, partly there's there are composites of my friends and brother and nephew and other people in my life as well in that. But I mean, they were they were very easy to write. I mean, that I think that that section of of that novel was written its first draft in a few days. Um, it was there was just no problem at all. Um, and actually, when it comes to From a Low and Quiet Sea, absolutely, I, I saw, I drove past an ambulance on a very, very cold day, um, and the ambulance was parked um, at the end of Sarsfield, of, of Toman Bridge in Limerick, and the back doors of the ambulance were open, and there was a small group of people just standing up and looking mournfully into the back of the ambulance, and I knew something terrible had happened, um, and I didn't want to know any more, I drove on, um, it was none of my business. And I, it just formed, it just, this, this scene formed to me. It was something about a, an older man and a young guy at the back of the ambulance that just looked familiar almost, you know, and there was something about their body language that, that suggested contrition on both their parts and some kind of coming together after a period of, of estrangement. Something, I don't know what it was. Now, maybe I, I, I'd say I plugged all those things in myself, really. But it just, that, that scene formed itself in my imagination as the last scene of From a Long Quiet Sea. And the actors in that scene Came to be fully formed and what was happening in the ambulance came to be fully formed as well you know um and it just it went from there and i said okay i'm going to lead i'm going to lead the characters up to that point i'm going to have all the characters converge at this point in their lives at this place you know and i don't i didn't feel any obligation to you know to have a huge amount of of revelations of you know of twists being revealed um it just i wanted them to to to, to wind their way gently through their lives to this point. And definitely when it came to that, I mean, I, I was so appalled at the time and still am, of course, about the situation where our, our brothers and sisters were, were drowning in the Mediterranean, trying to get to safety, trying to get over to us, you know, to, to Europe, to see if we could take care of them on a daily basis. Um, 
and and the idea of you know the Elietna was out there at the time the Irish Navy ship was out there and, and on a daily basis lifting people from the water to safety and that's such a beautiful idea but this you know that that beauty has as it synthesis the awful tragedy of people who aren't saved people who fall into the water and and and, and drown you know trying to get to safety you know, people from Syria, I mean, you should, shouldn't we have opened our arms to them and said, OK, you know, anybody from Syria who wants to come to our country, you know, you can come. Now, I know, I know there are all sorts of considerations that, and you can't be, you know, absolutely black and white and, and you know, certain about how things should be done. But that was on my mind at the time. And I was thinking at the time as well, I'd read um, a book, um, Kamala Shamsi's book, Home Fire, and there's a passage where a character asks a kind of, you know, a well-to-do middle class um, Middle Eastern character, you know, why aren't you in a boat in the Mediterranean? And I remember thinking to myself, why aren't I in a boat in the Mediterranean? You know, or why aren't I on a Greek island helping people? You know, what am I doing here making up stories? You know, and, and I think I, I felt to myself, you know, I, I have to do something. I have to say something about this. I have to kind of, I have to put something into the world that will somehow make people feel something about this the way I feel about it. You know, and you know, that brings with it the kind of, again, the question, what do I know? Um, who do I think I am to tell people this is how you should feel? Because the one thing I always try to avoid in fiction is being tendentious, is trying to maneuver the audience towards a certain conclusion, mm. you know, or towards a certain belief, to try to make them share my belief about a thing. Mm. And of course, that kind of tendentious fiction has a place in the world. Of course it has. You know, Orwell's 1984, of course, has a function. All those books, you know, that are absolutely created for a, a very specific purpose have a function. But it's, it's something I try to avoid. But what is that shared belief, Donnelly? Sorry, what is that shared belief you're trying to drive the reader towards? I mean, is it some kind of goodness in community? Is it? See, I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm really not like. I mean, I, I, I don't want to say to a reader, "This is this is my view of the world, and this is what your view of the world should be." This is just my view of the world. This is just my. This is this is my articulation of my experience of humanity. That, and that's all it is. You know, I don't have any lofty ambitions and I don't have any lofty notions about who, who I am or what I know. Um, and I think, like, I think if, you, if, I, if I, for myself, if I overanalyzed the artistic impulse that I feel, I think <laughs> it, can, it could very quickly burn out. You know, it could, it could very quickly start to feel ridiculous again. <laughs> and my old feeling could start to, to, to resurface. Please don't, please don't let that happen. <laughs> we don't want to push in that direction for God's sake. Um, um, I, but I, maybe we can ask you, however, actually to make some kind of judgment about the past and the present, even over the course of your short life. It does seem that your novels are suffused with a, with, with a kind of a kindness that seems to be almost rural and Catholic and Irish in a sense that we thought of ourselves, and, and maybe we were right about this, in the past. I, I wonder how you feel about the, the death of that Ireland, the passing away of that Ireland that you depict with, 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 with it seems to me, with, with great affection, yeah. as well as with concern. What, what have we lost or what have we gained? And any thoughts on that? See, I think, you know, I mean, change is, is <coughs> inexorable. We, there's nothing we can do to, to, to reverse the march of progress. Um, and, I, 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 and I don't think that Irish people have changed fundamentally. I think, mm. you know, and I think, and again, I mean, you can't talk about a whole nation in, in one sentence or one paragraph or one book and you can't generalize about anybody but I mean the Ireland I grew up in is definitely still there um, but you know after all I said just to be political about it for, for a minute I mean things like a government who tell us you know that we have to shut down post offices in order to provide better service to people I mean that's an oxymoron that doesn't make any sense you know, and I and I, I really want to challenge politicians on that all the time. How can closing down a rural post office or a rural guard station result in better service for rural people? You know, I mean, you know, there are loads of people in Ireland, and all they want in their in their location is the guard station and the post office. You know, and that will give them security at a church, of course. That will give them security in their beds. You know, it will give them a feeling of happiness and peace that they can go to the post office to get their pension and that there'll be a guard nearby if something happens. Um, it's something people always had. And, you know, to take that off people and say to them, this is for your own good. You know, I remember, I remember the, the, the DVO, District Veterinary Office, being closed in Limerick, where my wife worked, and she loved working there. You know, she loved dealing with the farmers who come into her on a daily basis, into the office. They could come into the office with a sheaf of papers to sort out their herd, their herd, their, their, their herd of cattle, you know, with a human. And the government decided to close 
the district veterinary office in Limerick and they told the farmers, some of whom were single men in their 80s, up even into their 90s, they told them, you can do it online. Imagine saying to a man who's shoving 90, you can go online, start out your herd, you know. When for, you know, for, for probably 50 or 60 years, they were used to driving to the local DVO, you know, to speak to a, a human about their herd numbers and getting it all sorted out and going home again. I mean, that's, that, that, takes, that takes a real, you know, that t- you have to be obtuse, you know, you have to really be, you have to really convince yourself that, of something that, can't, that, 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 that nobody could really be reasonably convinced of to do that. But that's the kind of thing that really upsets me. Um, actually, you know, what might be really good at this point, if you don't mind, actually, um, it's very short. Um, there's a, a fantastic poem by Martin Dyer called Death in the Post Office. Um, can I read it? Please do. Oh, yeah, Martin Dyer, you know Martin, he's a fantastic poet, one of my favourite poets of all time. This is Death in the Post Office by Martin Dyer. The job they're given is fairly simple. Find a place, go in for half an hour and discuss the settlement. Consider, if it's appropriate, the few antiques, the safe, the signs, the switchboard. Glance at the books, the electrics, perhaps fill out some forms. But these old ones, these Kathleen's, these Annie's, they can be fierce, long-winded. For some of our lads, their ways are just too compelling. Some accept a drink. Some will have lunch with a Polish guy who took a 92-year-old out in the van. She showed him a ball alley. Fair enough. Dozens of ghosts and no graffiti. But if you're not direct about the job, you understand we've had to weed out the dreamers. Immunity to stories, I find, is the primary quality. You don't want to be sitting at an old table under a clock that strikes you as fabulously loud. Or find yourself cradled by the past, thinking a man need venture no further west than the brink he meets in a mouthful of milky tea. In the, if the archive harboring frailty of the postmistress soothes you, if her wit grants you the lost farm and the maternity of the world, if her isolated dwindling village, a place without a pub or a shop, whose nearest decent sized town is itself desperately quiet, if mm. these things move you, what I mean is, if you can't meet a forgotten countryside head on and calmly dismantle her, fold her up, carry her out and ship her back to head office, however ambiguous, however heavy handed or fateful, however bloody poignant the whole affair might seem to you, if you can't stand your ground when a steep moment of hospitable chat and reminiscence might tempt you to put your mobile phone on silent or worse, blinded by plates of fruitcake to switch it off completely. If you cannot accompany an inevitable change, knowing you did not cause these people these ways to vanish, and if you will not sign off on expired things for us, then I'm sorry, but you are not our man. Isn't that great? Well, that's absolutely marvellous, and, and, and it speaks to the same commitment as you clearly have yourself to rural Ireland and to those institutions of the past that, as you said, actually are symbolised by the barracks, the church, the post office. Yeah. They, were the, they were the kind of units that held people together, the community all in one. And, and I do can't help noticing that you're wearing your GAA shirt there too, yes, so yes. maybe that's the fourth. <laughs> The well, fourth I've worn this jersey actually almost constantly since um, my wife gave it to me for Christmas. Um, it's the commemorative jersey for um, Bloody Sunday. It's the jersey that the Tipperary footballers wore on November 21st, 1920, when crowd forces invaded Croke Park and killed 14 people, including Michael Hogan, um, a footballer from Grange Mockler. I think you can see him there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, he was the only player killed that day. Um, and he actually, Michael had fought with. Um, British soldiers from the Essex Regiment the day before on the train up to Croke Park and apparently he had thrown six English soldiers, British soldiers, from the train. <laughs> and we know a little bit about this and Mike particularly actually because indeed we did have a celebration here on the Irish Influence uh, just before Christmas actually of the centenary right, and we heard some, some beautiful, beautiful stories about that. But yes, yeah, so these are the elements of Rustic Ireland. And as you're saying, actually, there are things that we must cling to. You, you, you said rather sadly that, of course, is the case that progress continues and, and the modern world happens indeed. But there are pieces of the past that we desperately must hold on to. Can I just speak about one of those that you mentioned again, the church? We've had very little reference to the church, but of course, 
certainly um, your most recent novel is suffused with religiosity and mm. churchness and people's deep devotion to the church, their fealty to the church, and, and, and all that they gain from that. How, how, anything to be said about that in an Ireland in which the church seems to have been excised from our everyday life? Well, I mean, I, to be honest, personally, I feel it's a good thing that religion is now optional. You know, that religion isn't forced on anybody. Religion should be optional um, and belief should be optional. Um, and, you know, the, the comfort of the church is still available to people. But, um, you know, I mean, I'll never, ever turn my back on my Christian faith, ever. Um, I'll never, ever disavow Jesus Christ, ever. It'll never happen. But, I, you know, the separation of church and state for me actually is a good thing. Um, and, I, you know, I mean, there was a time when we certainly lived in a theocracy, you know, and, you know, I, I, but I think we, we still beat ourselves up about this in Ireland. Um, you know, theocracies had held sway all over the world. Um, you know, when we talk about how people were treated in Ireland, you know, up to 30, 40 years ago, it wasn't just Ireland, it was everywhere. Um, but we seem to have, we, we do definitely have a particular, um, you know, a particularly kind of strong feeling in Ireland that that we have to shut these things down. That, we, that the sh church needs to go away. And I mean, the church, you know, I don't think so. I, people receive such comfort from sacraments and from the Eucharist and from going to mass. I mean, you know, I go to mass myself regularly with my mum, and it's just it's something that I love doing. Um, and I mean, that's really it, you know. And I I, I do believe that I've got the right. You know, I, I was raised in Catholic faith, and I, I and I think that I have a right to be an a la carte Catholic, you know. And I, I saw somebody a, a book came out recently um, by a journalist who had returned to her Catholic faith, and and she was saying, but you know, I don't believe this. I don't believe this thing the church say, and I don't believe this thing. And and I think she's got every right to, to disagree with things that the hierarchy say. But the, a reviewer of the book said, oh, no, 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 that's, that's rubbish. Join the army, wear the boots. You know, but I mean, the church isn't an army. We're not, we're not foot soldiers. Um, and we're absolutely entitled as, as paid up Catholics to disagree absolutely with some things that, that, that the Vatican said to us, you know, or nearly everything. You know, I mean, I, I find myself disagreeing with almost everything, except the imperative towards kindness. And I absolutely separate the celebration of the Eucharist from theocrats saying, this is the way you should live. This is the way people should live. This is the homogenous mass of humanity. This is the way that homogenous mass should act. You know, I mean, and, and I, there are such, you know, crazy anachronistic things about contraception and, and that kind of thing that just don't make any sense in the modern world. Um, but I mean, what are you going to do? You know, it's 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 it's, it's an internal it's an eternal problem. It's, it's it's an infinitely nuanced problem. It's you know, the church is in deep deep trouble. Churches everywhere are in deep trouble. I think. But what, what, what can you do, you've asked, but clearly you've, you, you've found an answer yourself and you know what you can do is that you can accept it and you accept what you, what you, uh, what you value from it in the past and you accept those pieces which are worthwhile to you and, and you feel the right not to do. And, and that seems to me to be, and I think to an increasing number of Irish people, a very honourable way to go forward. And um, there are questions coming in and, and uh, there are one particular thing that I'd like to, 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 to ask you. Uh, if you would remind us the name, uh, the title and the author of that poem and perhaps even what book yeah. it's from, yeah. if you wouldn't mind. And even if you hold it up to us, people can see yes. it. Thank you very, very much. Martin Dyer, D-Y-A-R, and the collection is made in names. It's one of the most beautiful collections of poetry I've ever read in my life. Um, and the poem is Death in the Post Office. It was actually on the, um, Martin's poem was on the uh, Leaving Search curriculum at the same time as my first novel. So we, you know, we, we, we visited some, some schools together and we, we had a show together called um, Hearts and Minds, you know, I really love doing, where he'd read my work and I'd read his poetry on stage. It was, it was great. Um, yeah, he's, he's an amazing poet. Beautiful. Thanks Good very much. Thank you for that. A lot of people actually that. Mike, uh, 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 any more questions? There that you'd like I have to some questions. Um, what about your female characters, Donald? Are there women characters in your books that you feel particularly good about and why? Yeah, um, I, I really, I, I have real fondness and love for a character called Melody She um, from All mm. Shadow. <laughs> from my maligned characters that seem to be very unpopular. Um, and the book did okay, actually, but you know, lots of people were, you know, almost violently opposed to Melody as a character. I really hatred for her. I thought she was great, to be honest. Um, and I mean, I thought, she, I, I really, I composed Melody from the heart, you know, and I really think that um, I, I struck, I struck close to some kind of truth about being the person that Melody is in the situation she's in. And again, I mean, 
because you can't not do it, you know, and I, again, I drew from myself, because what else do I have, you know, what, what else do I know for sure, except what happens inside myself, and even that's questionable at times. Um, but, you know, Melody, for me, rang really true, and her voice flowed, really, you know, and her voice rang true in my ears. And that book, actually, it's, you know, that's as close as I came to writing a book that was exactly, exactly as I intended it to be. Um, and the story itself worked out as I wanted it to work out, because sometimes, you know, a book can kind of, it can take its own momentum, it can take its own direction, it can kind of stop you in your tracks and say, actually, you know what, I'm going this way, you know, and sometimes it feels, and it's all from within yourself, but sometimes it feels as though this, you know, this, this outside energy um, comes into play. But all we shall know, I, I wrote pretty quickly, and I wrote it in kind of a, a fever of absolute recognition of the, of the character, an absolute, you know, knowledge of, of who she was, how she thought, um, what she was going to do. Um, and all, you know, it, but that's the same, it's same maybe with um, um, uh, Paddy Gladney's um, Moll. Moll, yeah, with Moll. I can't remember, I can't remember Moll's mum's name, imagine. Oh, Kit, Kit Gladney, yeah. This happens to me all the time. I forget characters' names and it makes me look um, really ridiculous. But yeah, Kit Gladney actually was a character again that I really love because I suppose Kit was drawn very much from my, 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 both my grandmothers and my mum and the way they think of the world and the way they operate within their faith. Um, you know, I mean, my family were always faithful people, um, but my mum has this really beautiful faith um, that's unquestioning. And, she's, and she also was a real kind of um, almost fully unarticulated faith in magic um, and the power of magic and, and you know, and, and the, the proximity of the next world. You know, and she she communes sometimes um, with ghosts without thinking about it. You know, she'll 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 speak to people who have departed this world who she loved, yeah. as, as though they still exist in a really lovely way. And she'll see signs. You know, I mean, she'll see signs in nature, and she'll see signs. She'll she'll she'll, she'll accept messages from robins and ravens, um, and and certain things that happen in in the atmosphere around us. You know, and she'll accept these things in her heart without question. You know, as being fact, as being just the way the universe works as being part of the eternal mystery of existence. Because what we know, I mean, you know, I mean, as, as much as science does and as, as necessary as it is, you know, what's really explained by science? You know, what nearly all of the mysteries of the universe are still mysteries. You know, I mean, and I, I you know, I'm, and I'm really like invested in science. I, I read science books all the time. I love, I love science, but I, I but I, I make absolute room for for magic, as in, you know, things that are in the universe that we can't explain, that we don't know about. And then one, one thing, Don, I mean, uh, obviously we've lived now for nearly a year in this weird word of COVID. Uh, and something you were talking about earlier about kind of Royal Island struck me, and it was a debate on the radio about the kind of the mart, and the people in charge said the mart must go online. And endless people, it must have been a Joe Duffy who were phoning up and saying, look, I've been selling at the mart. I've been driving my cows to the mart every week. I can't just go online. I'm 70. Yeah. And you have the same tension around um, something else you touched on, uh, touched on the religion, church services. Oh, we know we can't be in church. We've got to be online. And I do think there's this strange tension at the moment. I find I spend a lot of time in Connemara that you have the Amazon man driving or the, you know, yeah. DHL man driving around, delivering everything. Everybody's out in their kind of lycra leggings doing their walks. Mm. Uh, everybody's got their Wi-Fi. The kids, are, the kids, teenagers in Royal Island are shopping at Boohoo like they're yeah. um, city contemporaries. But, you know, one that we have this huge, everything you've got, that kindness, that community, that abrasiveness, where everybody still comes together. And yet this kind of bombarding sense of the outside world is now being delivered in a brown box. Mm. Um, do you think, and then we also have that weird tension at the minute, oh, everybody because of online working is going to move back to the country. Uh, I mean, clearly, you know, villages are going to be restocked with people magically. <laughs> Where are you with COVID? I mean, do you see rural Ireland going through some big shift? Is it too early to call? What's, what's your sense of what's going on? It's still the same people. Oh God, yeah, you just, you summed up there, Mike, you know, the, the idea of the DHL van, you know, becoming the, the local shop. Um, and that just, that, that 
fragmenting of, of communities and a kind of a, a, a strange colonization of rural Ireland by mm. people from urban areas who are well to do who could afford to buy land and houses in rural areas and you know, um, and this kind of strange yeah this kind of strange shift to demographics all over the country um, but you know it's not always all a, a bad thing um, and actually, just funny about Marx, you mentioned Marx there, um, the whole thing of Marx going online, I mean, men will still go to the Marx, and while the Marx worker is parading the animals in the, in the ring inside, you know, with the camera, um, the lads will be out, just outside, you know, huddled around the laptop on the bonnet of a jeep, you know, which is actually, which creates far more danger, because they're actually closer together than they would have been if they were actually inside the Marx. <laughs> and you see it all the time, you can see seven or eight farmers around, around a small laptop screen in front of a jeep, you know, with their faces pressed together. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's counterproductive and it, it, it's not working at all. Um, and please God, you know, hopefully within a few months, this will be behind us, this, 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 this weird nightmare that we've all been landed in. And things will go back to some kind of normal. And I hate this idea. People say, oh, we'll never go back to normal. Well, why won't we go back to normal? You know, why, why, why not? Like, I mean, if there, if there is a vaccine, why won't we go back to normal? And people saying strange things like, no, the world has changed forever. What the hell? Why is the world changed forever? I don't, I don't really believe that. I really, I'm really, really, I, that upsets me to hear that. Like, and people just accepting that, you know, this kind of blasé acceptance. Oh, no, things will never be the same again. I really doubt that, um, and you know, I, I really, I really hope that that's that's not true. Is the cow to still going to be sold, and the middle class right to still going to write, <laughs> <laughs> especially ones with English accents. That's it. Uh, that's lovely. Listen, I think we, we we've come to the end of our time, and there's still some more questions there, but I think that we're just going to have to leave them for the moment. And and to thank you, Donal, for what was a conversation. Every bit as lovely as anybody who's read your books would have expected. And very particularly, can I just remind them actually of your latest one here, which is of course, Strange Flowers. And it is one of the most moving, one of the most beautiful books that you're likely to read that I've read in a very, very long time. Everything about it seems to speak of Joan and Ryan. Everything about Joan and Ryan speaks of Strange Flowers. It's been totally delighted to have you here. Thank, Thank you, you so much, George. It's been my pleasure. And thanks, Mike. And thanks to you all for um, attending. I really, really enjoyed it, the chat. Um, it's just been, it's just, it's always a pr privilege and a joy to be associated with BC in any way at all with you guys. Um, and thanks very much. Thank you very much, Don. Thank you so much. And just before we go, guys, can we say, Mike, maybe you might tell us a little bit about what's coming up next week and indeed in the coming weeks. What's coming up next week, Joe, is um, a kind of an academic who turned into a writer or the other way around. Uh, we're joined by Emily Pine, who's going to be going out to BC in the fall of 2021 as a Burns scholar. Um, but obviously uh, a, a very fine scholar on um, many kind of issues around contemporary Ireland, a literature scholar, um, but also the author of the award-winning Notes to Self from 2018-2019. Uh, we're then going to be followed by four weeks of discussions of the Irish Nobel laureates. So we're going to have Fintan O'Toole talking about uh, George Bernard Shaw, Lauren Arrington talking about Yates, we're going to have Lois Moore Overbeck talking about Beckett and then Geraldine, uh, Geraldine Higgins talking about uh, Seamus Heaney and then we move on through a whole welter of other people, uh, Sarah Townsend, Eve Watson and the list goes on right through the end of May. So we're going to be dominating 2021 in a big way. Yeah, so thanks everybody very, very much. Same link, we'll get you here at the same time, 4.30, 9.30 if you're this part of the world. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks again, Donald, for such a delight. Really, really pleasurable. And thanks, everybody, for joining us here. And thanks to the uh, Consul General for their support throughout. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. And thank you, Donald. You're welcome back anytime. Thanks a lot, Mike.